Hello and welcome back to The Consistency Project with E.C. Sinkowski. My name is Patrick Cummings and every episode here I have the privilege of having a discussion with E.C. on subject matters that range from nutrition to fitness to the choices we can all make to live a healthier, more functional life. By exploring both the principles at play and the actions worth carrying out as a result, it's our goal to get you thinking, get you moving, and get you taking more consistent steps toward optimizing your well-being. Thank you so much for tuning in to the show this week. I am here with just a quick introduction to a conversation that EC had recently with Kelly and Juliet Sturett. For those folks who have been around the CrossFit space for a while or just been paying attention to health and fitness in general, you may recognize the Sturettes. They are the authors of The Supple Leopard. They are the creators of The Ready State, and they are the authors of the new book, Built to Move. This is a fantastic book. I'm so excited for you to get a sense of that with this conversation. Both EC and I highly recommend you go check out the book. The links to it are in the show notes, so do be sure to pre-order or grab it if it's out when you listen to this. Without further ado, here is EC with Kelly and Juliet Sturet. Kelly and Juliet, thank you so much for coming on The Consistency Project. Thank you so much for having us. We are pumped to talk to you. You're and our favorite. And, and, We're fans. <laughs> we just have to say the consistency project. That's so sexy. Does I mean, does that just reach out into TikTok land and grab people? Because <laughs> unfortunately, that is the truth. Yes. It's it's really a great marketing title for sure. It's very sexy. <laughs> um, we though are talking about your new book, Built to Move, which I just finished over the weekend, loved reading it. Mentioned to you all, it was like really just resonated with me with the back to the basics all of that stuff. Um, and it's coming out April 4th, correct? Correct. Awesome. And so we're going to put all of the links to purchase the pre-order and all of that stuff in this episode, but just to kind of thing, kick things off here, like just let's start with like a general premise about it. You know, who Mm -hmm. is it for? How did it come to be? And, And what really void do you think it's filling in the book? An education space. There is two sides to this coin. And let me take this performance side first. Hmm. One of the things that we know, because for the last, you know, for as long as we've known each other, I have, and we have worked in very high performance environments where we're helping people win world championships and world cups. And we're helping big organizations like the army sort through its musculoskeletal issues. We're trying to get teams like the All Blacks or the English national soccer team, all of these big high performance, very big high dollar organizations to help people be more durable. And what through our work there, we've realized that these practices therein in the book, Built to Move, are really have become our foundation base camp practices off of which we then can build high performance. And so the book on the one hand is for everyone who wants to go fast, who lift more weights, is interested in doing these things. And we're making sure that we can identify potential blind spots for them because it is easy to end up in a little sort of your own eddy and you're doing your own thing and you realize, wow, I actually have greater capacity. And some of the things that are maybe the error signals that are throwing up in your system are a result of not having some vital signs, not having some benchmarks for your own behaviors off of which now you're hanging pretty gnarly intensity and performance. So that on the one hand, we have found that we've given this book to a lot of world champions and a lot of superstars like yourselves. And you might find you're like, oh, I I should lean into that a little bit more or, hey, I wasn't paying attention to that and maybe I should. Yeah, and I think if I could take the other side of it, you know, as you know, we owned a commercial gym for 17 years. And then we also are parents who live in a suburban community and are, have sort of become like the node of, um, sort of health and fitness in our community. You know, people come to us to say, Hey, should I be intermittent fasting? What workout should I be doing? Well, how much should I be doing? Right? Like we're sort of this, um, hub of questions for like the normal people set, like the people that we're friends with around our community and, you know, friends of our, uh, you know, parents of our kids, friends, you know, they're like busy working people who do care about their health, but are very confused, but are very confused and, uh, are overwhelmed by the fire hose of information that is being, um, you know, uh, served to them on social media on a daily basis. And they also are really busy 
and they need strategies and tactics for their health that they can actually do in a busy life and and with maybe only an hour of time or an hour and a half of spare time to actually take care of all these things. Um, and so I think, you know, we had like on the one hand, we're working with all these athletes and seeing that, you know, even they had really big blind spots in terms of sort of their overall health practice. And then on the other hand, we have this sort of regular people, you know, set, um, and, and I would say in that, in that set, they're all people who do like, they care about their health. They want to feel good. They want to be out of pain. They want to make sure their body composition is decent. They want to be able to feel good when they get older. Like this is sort of that set. And, and we just saw that they are totally overwhelmed and confused. And so we spent a lot of time thinking about like, what is it that we actually do in our lives? Um, because contrary to what I think a lot of people see on the internet, we're not the like fitness people who spend four hours a day perfectly meal prepping our food and, um, and working out for four hours on video. You know, we basically do what everybody else does, which is we're like hunchbacked over a laptop for the vast majority of our days. And so, so we were like, what are we actually doing that has consistently worked for us in, in the midst of a crazy busy life and what are the things that we're recommending to the high performers um, and how can we sort of synthesize all that? So I think what's different about this book is, you know, there's tons of diet books out there and there's tons of exercise books out there and there's, you know, now starting to be tons of books about, you know, like self-care and how to manage your mental health, but there's not really one book that says, Hey, here's just this like short list of things you need to keep an eye on if you want to feel good, stay out of pain and be a durable human. So I think it's yeah. kind of those two things together. And if I added one more thing, you know, switching from the coin to a stool model, three supports. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, if we who are in fitness and health and wellness are really apply a filter and say, how are we doing in terms of actually transforming society? We don't really get a very good grade. It seems that all the metrics that we care about in terms of public health seem to be trending in the wrong direction from depression to substance abuse to diabetes, you know, obesity, ob I mean, choose something you care about, ACL injury rates and in young kids. It's all going in the wrong direction. And so if I have to say, look back and say, well, how is this trillion dollar experiment that we've been running, especially in the last 10 years, where some of us have access to incredible resources, our collabs with our friends, the, my, I mean, you, I, if I have a nutrition problem, I just call you and then you sort it out for me. So the thing though is we have left everyone behind. And I have to say that I think fitness needs to think differently about the behaviors and where we institute these things. We've come to believe that the family or the functional unit of the person living with the, their community is the functional unit of change. That hyper locality is where we have to make this possible. Yeah, that brings us something else I want to get to. But I do think the book really does a great job of kind of speaking to the different levels from kind of the the regular everyday person to the high level athlete. And, and I struggle with that a little bit, even with the 800 gram challenge, turns out some high level athletes can also just eat some more fruits and vegetables in their diet. But I think you did a really great job and you have these, you know, 10 vital signs tests that help people kind of assess where they are. Um, and I think it's just a really great roadmap for, for what you just said, but how did those come to be? You know, I, I have 10 principles of nutrition. I understand that 10 concepts can be equally important, kind of like you discuss about your vital signs. And so it's like, how did they come to be? Um, and I know again, all of them have relevance, but are there like one and two, one or two of them you're like, oh yeah, this is always going to be an issue or more popular troublemakers than oh, others, no. shall I say? <laughs> Keep in mind that when we wrote Supple Leopard, um, you know, we had two objective measures in there. And this was really important. I don't think people saw that. One was range of motion, which is sort of unequivocal. You know, not everyone is so special. Within a standard deviation, almost two, what we see is there's a lot of very normal range of motion. This is what every physician, every physical therapist, every doctor looks at. Your shoulder should be able to do this. Your knee should be able to do this. And yes, I'll give you three degrees on either side of that, but really what we can say is this is what is expected in a human body. And the other objective measure there then was about biomotor output. Can we go faster? Can we improve wattage? That really is the brass tacks of all the things that matter. Because 
what we found was that if we weren't objective in our descriptions, it was really difficult to say, you know, pain, no pain, that was important, but less of an important conversation. More important was, hey, we are returning you to your native abilities, and in those native abilities, you have more movement choice and better expression of that power. So imagine now that we're seeing all of these other behaviors really become germane to the conversation of tissue health and range of motion. And, and we, we sort of realize that we have to become decently comp, uh, you know, competent in conversations about sleep if we're going to help people manage pain and surgery recovery. Right? We're going to have to talk about micronutrients if we're going to talk about your connective tissue health. And at some point we're like, well, well, what's connected. not important, <laughs> right? So in the, you know, one of the things that we started to see is, for example, 800 grams, if you only eat 750 grams or 700, no one dies, but it gives you a nice benchmark of understanding where you should be, I'm above, I'm below, and it helps you create a reference model line where you can begin to have sort of a normative value. And one of the things that we started to see, again, these objective measures, we saw that people weren't taking some objective measures in their range of motion, in some of their behaviors. And that's really where we started to winnow down what is essential and how can we help people have benchmarks here so that they can realize, oh, I'm a little bit off or this isn't a problem right now. But now we can advance the conversation because people know what they should be able to do and expect. And again, these 120 over 80, is a blood pressure that everyone on the planet knows. And that's not great blood pressure. That just says, hey, you're, you know, you're above you're or below fine. this, you're doing yeah. fine, or hey, let's pay attention to this, right? So when we start to apply that, and we saw that especially in the pandemic, where suddenly our family members are talking about their SAO2 and, you know, and their respiration rates. And I was like, okay, well, if you're sophisticated about that, why don't we talk about why you can't squat to depth and why that may become a good vital sign for us? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess then just following up on that, I, I love the idea of the objective measurements. And I think I deal a lot in nutrition about people um, always talking about how they feel after certain diet changes. Right. And, and there can be some disconnect between like feelings and the outcomes we want. So this ob objectivity is great. But yeah, are there a couple in there that you that you're like, yeah, like these are always the issue for our professional athletes or yeah, these are for more of the everyday exercise or we know this is going to be something we talk about. And I know, again, all 10 are important, but I would just say more popular ones than others. Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll, I'll take a crack at that. I think um it's, it's hard to choose a few, but if we're talking about the professional athlete set, um, I think one of the biggest ones we've seen actually is, and, and this may come as a surprise, is a lack of overall movement. Um, mm. And so, you know, we see this a lot in the CrossFitters and the recreational athletes as well, but it's sort of this, okay, I did my training session for one hour or two hours or whatever, and then, you know, I sat for the remaining 14 hours a day. And that is, mm -hmm. you know, that's true also of a lot of professional athletes. In fact, you know, Kelly's worked in some elite military groups and, you know, their prescription now for, um, their, their guys and women who are not sleeping well is to actually walk more. That's their first order of business is walk more right. because even though they may be doing the obstacle course and all this radical stuff all day long, they may actually not be getting enough total movement in their day to become tired enough at the end of the day. Um, mm. So, I mean, I think for my part, one of the things we see universally across both the sort of like weekend warrior and more serious athlete set is just not enough total daily movement. Um, you know, not enough standing, walking, you know, kneeling, sitting on the floor, just all those kind of like extracurricular movements. And, and then I think, you know, sleep is a universal problem. So I, I would add that to the mix as well. And then, and then I, I'm now all of a sudden just going to add all the vital signs, but if I were to lump together all the <laughs> range of motion, I don't know how, if I were to, if I could just lump together all of the range of motion specific vital signs, I think that's a huge missing piece for people. I think, you know, what, what, I, what I think this sort of general public thinks of as like health these days is two things. It's like, well, I'm either on some kind of diet, body composition, body composition, mm -hmm. and I'm exercising and that's it. And maybe sleep is starting to, um, creep into that conversation. Thanks to Matt Walker and sort of some like, you know, attention paid to sleep these days. I think that's creeped into the, the broader conversation more, but I think a lot of these other things like balance and actually caring about your range of motion, um, and why you should care. I mean, 
I think that's really one of our big jobs as we try to tell people about this book is like, why should you care about your range of motion? And why should you noodle on it a little bit? And, you know, how is it going to impact your life if you don't have it? So um, I did a terrible job answering your question because I basically said every vital sign is important. I get it. I, love, I get this question. That? I love when people are like, what's the top three mobility moves? I'm like, what you're really asking me there is... What part of my body should I not care about? Let, let me add something. Totally. Though. Let me add something. Hey, I get that on the nutrition front, so I had to put you guys in the hot seat. <laughs> yeah, let, let me let me add something though. I mean, we did have a ton of conversations, and there are some things we specifically decided not to include. Um, and and yeah. as as you know, we discussed briefly before this, uh, uh, we didn't want to have a formal vital sign chapter on exercising. Um, as you can see, we put it as, right. as sort of an afterword in our book. Um, and even though we've spent our life exercising, owned a gym that was all about exercising, um, we wanted to, we, we, we did, we wanted to sort of downplay that as a factor here because we feel like, again, people have gotten that message. That's the mm-hmm. thing, whether they're doing it or not is a different question, but right. everybody knows they should be exercising. Now people don't know what exercise to do, how much for how long. I mean, I think there's still a lot of confusion around that, but, but we specifically excluded that because we didn't want to be put into this category of exercise book. We think that that message has gotten out there. You know, we specifically didn't include hydration. We think hydration is important, but we didn't feel for our sake that it was worthy of an entire chapter of this book. Um, and so there were definitely some things we decided not to include, um, which may be more telling them even what we did include. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, that's good. So one of the things that I was thinking about when I was reading the book is you were mentioning um, in the mobility stuff, especially about the hips, that I guess there's studies that finds there's less arthritis for people in China. And I'm guessing it's because they just have more general movement, right? Using the squat position a little bit more, a little less chairs. And so I thought that was interesting. But then on the flip side, you know, especially in our kind of CrossFit um, culture, we hear a lot about kind of the wear and tear arthritis, the osteoarthritis that often can be limiting for people in their movement. And so it was just sort of interesting. It's like, okay, on one hand, we have this need to want to have movement to prevent arthritis. But on the other hand, I know plenty of people who are prevented from doing things because of arthritis. And so what do you think is kind of the more uh, danger? Is it is it more of this overuse or more of lack of use that we should kind of be worried about? But again, let's let's start by saying, what is it your body is capable of doing? Mm. Can you do those things? And that actually works at this level, lower level. For example, we start the book with this really simple sit and rise test. Mm -hmm. You don't have to have big range of motion to do it. You don't have to be very strong to do it. In fact, you don't even have to have full range of motion to do it. You just need some range of motion to be able to get up off the ground in that position. We find a lot of adults struggle with some of those basic hip shapes to be able to sit cross-legged, crisscross applesauce on the ground. And that's a real mid-range position. Notice that we didn't say overhead squat all the way down. We just said, can you squat about parallel with your feet, you know, without having to do crazy stuff with your foot position? Because those are real mid-range positions and mid-range capacities. So one of the things that we see, I think, is supported by all of the literature and all of the practical experience is keeping people in their normative ranges, giving them back access to their positions, and then making sure that they're actually spending time in the shapes. And if it was one thing we pulled out from CrossFit early on, it was saying, hey, if even if you're not squatting, you know, we didn't get stapled in a full clean, we're still going to squat today. It just may be that you're squatting a third of the way down to a high box, and that's where we're squatting, but we're still squatting. So we're gonna, the first order of business was to expose people to movement in their available ranges as we worked on returning them. Oftentimes when we see in the these power populations, right, mm. high level athletes, because I put out enough fires, you know, and get enough people on speed dials saying they have problems, we sort of have two things going on. One is, the intensity and volume that people are training oftentimes isn't supported by their nutrition and their recovery and adaptation. And so what we have potentially is we're not getting all the building blocks on hand to be able to handle the kinds of volumes and stresses. Mm. If anything has happened in the last decade plus, especially 15 years, is that all the secrets of intensity and high volume training are out. I mean, if you want to go on the internet and train like 
you know, Matt Frazier or Mal or, you know, any of these people, you can do that easily, even though you're not set up for it, don't have the mechanics for it, but you can, ha- you can throw yourself into the fire anytime you want. Mm-hmm. And then simultaneously, as we work towards understanding all the complexities in the body, we have to ask people, do you have full range of motion? I'm working with plenty of world-class athletes who cannot do basic range of motion tests. They just don't have access to that for whatever reason, an old injury, some way of training, this, this style of training that I'm currently doing makes it that, so my internal rotation goes away. And suddenly, because we don't have a pain signal that pops up in our brains, we can continue to work around that problem until it becomes so bad that suddenly the brain says, okay, now we're going to get you to pay attention. You become sensitized. So underlying there, one of the first things we always do when we're working with professional athletes or high-level athletes is say, hey, let's make sure that we're keeping an eye on these basic ranges of your tissues because working around or with incomplete mechanics or compensated positions certainly stresses tissues a little bit more than they would be. And that's when we start to see a whole host of sort of issues and changes. But ultimately, if we're talking about, hey, should I be worried about sitting on the ground? No, you shouldn't. If I should be, should I be worried about being able to put my arms over my head? No, you shouldn't. You know, do I need to have good mechanics in order to do two or 300 pull-ups a day at like high speeds while kipping on the bar? That's certainly going to make a more robust shoulder in the long haul. Yeah. Does that answer your question? For sure. And I mean, that's what I was thinking about too, when I saw the section on rucking, which I love. Um, rucking is something, especially when my back was bad, that I, I like to use a lot. And it was, I think you had a great quote in there or something along the lines of like, it's like, what, cardio for the strength guys and strength training for the cardio guys or something like that. <laughs> yeah, I think that's um, a Jason McCarthy quote. It's awesome. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I love it. Um, and it's so true. But I think with that, it was like, hey, this is a great replacement for kind of the runner who no longer can run because of their knees. And so then I was thinking, well, that's interesting. Like, is that is that kind of what you're saying, that maybe they were just doing too much of like the power and the intensity and they just had the poor mechanics in the running and that's why they're not doing it? Like what is really contributing to the fact mm-hmm. that, you know, we do end up subbing potentially a lot of running with rucking? But let me start by saying that we never really define running right? Mm. I'm, I'm walk, moving faster than walking. Okay. Then you're running. Great. I mean, apply that to anything swimming. So if I'm flailing around, but moving my body, am I swimming? You know, no, it's not really swimming. That doesn't looks like right. swimming. So right. one of the things that, you know, I think because we've had the chance to work with so many elite running programs, especially Olympic sprinter level problem, uh, you know, groups, is that these movements are all hyper technical to have the best expression of a person's body most closely working with what we understand to be the highest expression of the movement, right? So if you are working with elite gymnasts, they look all sort of move the same and all our runners all sort of move the same. And then all of a sudden you come into the, the population like us, and you're like, yeah, I'm gonna get fit, I'm gonna pick, pick up a sport to get fit and no technique, no instruction, no warm up, no cool down, no support, no building, no range of motion. And all of a sudden what you see is that the body can manage these shapes and positions without training and without, you know, necessary sort of best practice or good practice around supporting that. And you can do that for a long time until Until you can't, maybe you can't. And I think that really is the thing. The problem also, or one of the reasons we're such fans of rucking or carrying a weighted backpack is that it get, what we tell people oftentimes is, you know, you need to go run to get fit. And we're like, Mm -hmm. hang on, why don't you just walk around your neighborhood and then let's get a little load on you before we talk about introducing this very complex running skill. There's a woman who runs in our neighborhood who makes me queasy every time I see it. Okay, okay, I have to interrupt you. I have to tell a story. So I'm like an armchair physical therapist thanks to being married to Kelly for 20 years. Yeah, and you have a little bit of One of, of the <laughs> worst parts of that is that I know enough about running mechanics to find watching, and this isn't just me, this is like our entire Ready State staff too. Watching recreational neighborhood runners like is one of the worst 
experiences for me. Like I see them and I immediately am analyzing every part of their mechanics. You know, we talk about it. We, we actually saw a guy from like 200 meters away in the car the other day. And I was like, Oh, Kelly, look at that guy. He actually looks like he's running pretty well. And then we, he got closer and closer and we're like, Oh, Oh God, look at his knee. It's totally valgus and coming in. And that guy's just two, two more steps away from an ACL tear. And, and so, I mean, Kelly really has, he's ruined us in terms of right. like seeing runners around the world. But I mean, I, I would just like to emphasize what he says. I think there's a couple other things going on. And I think this will also parlay back to probably something you see in your work, EC, yeah. which is, you know, running is so easy and accessible. So a lot of people do it. Um, I think the vast majority of people think because they can do it off the couch, that it isn't a tech, very technical thing and don't care at all about their technique. In fact, they just follow this pattern where they start in like a normal shoe and then they start to get aches and pains. And then they are in a cushier and cushier, cushier cloud shoe until one day when they're 43, they're like, I'm switching to biking, right? Like this is, we've seen this a thousand times in people. I think the other underlying thing is this sort of leftover, like psychological hellhole that we were put in with eighties and nineties fitness advice. And I think it also relates (laughs) to nutrition, but especially for women, um, Mm you know, as a child of the eighties and nineties and as a woman of the eighties and nineties, like we were all told like the ideal body size is to be stick thin. And no matter what you should 100% restrict whatever you're eating and barely eat. Right. And the way to ha- have the body you want is to run. Those were like, yeah. the, like literally if we could boil down what you learned as a woman in, in terms of taking care of your health and body and cont- tab. In, in the eighties and nineties, like it was like calorie restrict, like it's your job in life and run like literally yep. that that's all if you could boil down the 80s and 90s for women like those were the two pieces of advice we were given and mm-hmm. man that's deep like i still have that as deeply in you know and i don't even run at all but like it's deep and so i think when i see you know especially like i see so many women in my neighborhood in their 30s and 40s and man they're just running and their mechanics are terrible and you know, but I think it's just part of this like deep conditioning we got that it's like, if you want to be healthy and have the body composition you want, you need to calorie restrict and run. And I think Mm -hmm. that's one of the things we, as in like the collective you and we are, Mm -hmm. are facing as we're especially, you know, talking to people in their thirties, forties, fifties who come from that era. The other thing we could ask is say, well, running requires this amount of range of motion. Do you have the range of motion to go do this sport? Like, if you can't put your arms over your head, I'm like, how's swimming going to go for you? People are like, it's really hard. I'm like, okay, well, running could be the same thing. You don't have any hip extension. Can I see you stand on one leg? Oh, you can't. That's really what running is, going from one leg to one leg. Hey, how about hopping on one leg? Oh, you can't do that. Oh, well, that's going to be trickier because running is hopping from one leg to one leg. So if we even took a, a step back and said, well, let's just see if we can improve the components. Then we can actually say, what do you mean you can't run? Like human beings at no age should we have to miss range of motion. There's no, what we, all, I mean, running, look, your grandma doesn't need to be able to run a marathon, but a quick jog across the street, there's no reason why that can't be part of the modern language of what it is we're supposed to be able to do. So imagine these elemental skills. No, 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 I don't get up and down off the ground anymore. Well, that's going to be a problem for you. I guarantee you. So again, we can start to say, what is it we should be able to do? Let's use that model the way we do with retirement and start to work backwards. So if you want to retire or set business goals, you set a goal and you work backwards. And if the goal is for me to keep running because that is my joy and my jam, well then let's just work backwards and start asking the questions about that practice. And then we can really start to realize, well, if you're not sleeping a lot, that's going to be really hard on your tissues. If you don't decongest after that 5k run, that's going to be hard on your tissues. If you don't eat micronutrients because you're eating a a 900 calorie cup of coffee with fat in it, that's going to be harder on your tissues. So, you know, I think the problem is we're so durable innately that we put all of these stressors on ourselves and, and without understanding fundamentally good practice. And, And here's an analogy for people. Katie Bowman used this analogy in her book and it's, it's, I call it Bowman's orca. Who's Katie Bowman? Katie Bowman is a sort of nutritionist. Uh, uh, she's a sociologist, biomechanist, 
talking, I think it was move, move Your DNA. And one of the things that she talks about is if you put an orca in captivity, eventually that orca fin starts to fold over at the top. Mm-hmm. And the idea here is, well, why does that happen? Is the orca sad? No, it's not. You know, and they call it, they actually have a syndrome. It's called folded fin syndrome. Floppy f- syndrome mm-hmm. is too, too mean. So, but what ends up happening is because you put that orca in an environment where it can't load the collagen, it can't swim and fight and play and hunt, the collagen becomes weaker. Then you change the behavior of the orca. Now it's spending so much more time at the surface because it's in a water cage that that fin is subjected to greater gravitational loads because it's always at the surface. So you have this kind of two-part thing. Plus, I'm sure orcas aren't eating what they normally eat when they're in captivity. So you have, we've changed the environment, you've changed the loading, you've changed the nutrition, and what we see is degradation of the tissues. Can you imagine orcas not having an orca fin in the captivity, right. in, the, in the wild? That is what's happening to human beings. We just can't yeah. see it necessarily right away. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually something I remember, I don't even know, 10 plus years ago, one of the things that you said that I really liked, and it was like, yeah, we were, we were built for the long haul we were built durable. And then now sometimes maybe we kind of are moving now outside of where we should be moving or don't have the foundation and all of that stuff that's kind of led us down to various injuries and all of that stuff, which actually was kind of the, the next thing that I really found was interesting in the book. You were talking about some of the people that you work with who have chronic pain, probably you run into a few of them for various reasons, and some of the strategies that you use for chronic pain. And, and certainly I get that question from a nutrition point of view, mm. but from a movement point of view, um, I believe the prescription was, hey, we really start with breathing and walking, some pretty basic stuff. Do you mind kind of giving some insight into how those are all connected and related to pain? We should, everyone who's listening to this, let's start by saying that pain does not mean injury. Hmm. It does not mean tissue trauma. It doesn't mean damage. Pain is a request for change. And what you think to yourself is, it would be so nice if it didn't feel pain, and you'd die very quickly, <laughs> especially if you were in a CrossFit gym. You would just tear your arms off. So <laughs> what is it about my brain that has recognized a signal from the body as a threat? And all you need to do is be hyper-stressed, underslept, get in a fight with your partner, be, you know, smash a bunch of beer, eat a whole bunch of pizza, and then go smash yourself. And you'll see that all of a sudden your knees are a lot more achy than they, they needed to be. Can right? I make just one side point? You know, when they yeah. look at autopsy people, like almost everybody has disc problems in right. their low back. Right. Um, but only They're some not people are did not just, you know, cha- like whatever changes in their discs in their low back. Uh, everybody does, you know, everybody. Um, right. but why do some of those people experience chronic low back pain? Whereas other people Others. don't, right? That's a yeah. trip. Take I know. It away. So I think that's really important to understand is that our bodies innately can buffer normal aging. You know, I don't remember who we were talking to, but maybe it was you. It's like, if you took a picture of your face, and uh, you know, compared your face very close up, the quality of your skin, your wrinkles to your 18 year old self, you'd be like, that's what's happening in your body. And you would be horrified. And yet, you know, you're like, oh, this is normal and typical. Things change a little bit, right? right? <laughs> our, our ability to sort of, you know, we ha- I work with a lot of young superstars right now and literally I can cut off their hand and the next day it's grown back. I'm like, oh, let's do it again. <laughs> and it's, they're little salamanders. That and might it kind be of an exaggeration, but. <laughs> <laughs> Metaphorical cutting off. So ultimately when people are in a situation where they're experiencing persistent pain or chronic pain, we always take a systems approach. We start by saying, hey, the normal resting state for the human being is is pain-free. And pain is a normal experience. So let's not freak out about it. Mm-hmm. But also simultaneously, what are the where do you have agency and control to begin to signal to your brain at a physiologic level, right? What's happening at local tissues? Can we restore how they move? Can we have them better hydrated? Can we give them the nourishment they need to heal and to repair? Like that's why you know, I'm like, forget about protein for your muscles. How about protein for your connective tissue? How about micronutrients right. for your, you know, your tissues? Oh. So simultaneously, then we can also start to say, well, what are the physical inputs? How do we begin to signal to your brain? that this is a non-threat and it's okay. And it turns out breathing is one of those things where we have methods. I mean, it's Iyengar who said, nerves are king of the breath, 
the breath is king of the brain. So we have a way of signaling to the brain that this is a safe place by breathing. We can do isometrics and breath holds, and that can change sensitivity. What we realize is suddenly if we get people with low back pain doing these huge breaths, they're getting massive amounts of movement into their spines. Every inhale, they're extending. Every exhale, they're flexing. The rib cage is moving. The psoas is interfering, inter interacting with the diaphragm differently. And guess what? The brain's like, look at all this movement. That's cool. And suddenly the, the signal goes from 10 to nine and anyone can breathe. And it's such a powerful tool when you're in pain or when you're stressed. And it also is an, ends up being a really ex excellent diagnostic tool when you're training. So mm -hmm. we realized that one of these benchmarks was, hey, we want to have a set of tools and vital signs that we can spin up towards performance. We can use it as a reference position to understand how I am day to day, and we can lean into it when we really need help. And it turns out, again, what's not important when we're talking about pain. So when people come in with highly inflammatory diseases, right, diagnostics, they've been diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease or some of these autoimmune issues, the first thing we say is, have you met the 800 gram challenge? Have you met plant paradox? Have you met carnivore? Have you met ways of changing and stopping that bell ringing from your nutrition? Well, let's also get you moving and walking is maybe 10, 30 second walks around your kitchen island is walking. But our signal of let's not get any input into the system and let's ride that threat until we can blunt it with bourbon or THC or, you know, these other methods, which we, that's what we've given people. So we're, how, we shouldn't be surprised if, if we go get, see experts for help. And the first thing that expert does is give me something to get me out of pain. That seems really great, but it ignores all of the agency a person potentially has. Hmm. Yeah. One of the things I also loved about the walking, and I actually saw this article kind of recently, we talked about it a little bit on our podcast. It was like the 10 determinants of healthy aging and movements on there. But some of the other pieces are like social connection and faith and all of these other things. And one of the things that you brought up with walking was kind of the community aspect of it. I don't know if you're, you want to share the bus story or not, but I thought that's interesting too, right? Like if you can get them moving and walking and potentially it's in a social construct, how great would that be in terms of dissociating movement from pain, right? Because it's just another right. variable there. Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll tell a little bit about the walking bus story, but I think the community piece is huge. And so, you know, we were in the sort of, um, hamster wheel of, you know, driving our kids and dropping them off in the drop off lane, which I'm sure a thousand of your listeners do the exact same thing every day. And it's a, it's generally a horrible experience. If you want to see what's wrong with, yeah, you're stuck culture. in traffic. Everybody's tired. <laughs> Open know, a car door and watch yeah, the hate right. spill out. Yeah. Kids are, you know, everybody's stressed. It's rushed. You know, there's, it's just generally an unpleasant experience to drop off lane. Um, and, and so we were, you know, driving our kid every day, experiencing the drop-off lane, and then sort of realizing that at the same time we were starting to prescribe, I mean, this was way back in like 2010, that's when we were starting to think about and talk to people more about adding in more movement in their day and maybe switching to a standing desk. Like we were starting to talk about this in our adult population. And we thought to ourselves, hey, if we actually just woke up 20 minutes earlier, we could walk with our kids to school, um, which is about a mile and a half, and, you know, it allowed us to enter the school from this back, you know, the backside through this beautiful field and the playground. And, um, you know, it probably took us, I don't know, 20 minutes to get there or something. And so we just started doing this alone as a family. And it turned out to be this amazing family time together. I mean, we would like stop and pick flowers and look at worms and we'd talk about our days and we would drop our kids off and they would feel like they'd gotten a little movement. They were like totally ready for school, ready to learn. Um, we had avoided the entire stress of the drop-off lane. So we felt better. You know, we would get home by like 820 and we'd already walked 5,000 steps, which is like, yes, check. Like it's 820 in the morning. I've walked 5,000 steps. So, you know, it started to just be this lovely thing for our nuclear family. Um, and then I heard about this thing called the walking school bus, which is where you just have a parent or a group of parents meet at the same spot, rain or shine every day. And, you know, cause I think people, whether there's a fair fear in this or not, people in some cases are just afraid to let their kids walk to school. Um, and in definitely plenty of neighborhoods that that fear is, is justified. Um, and so, 
so we would just be there at the corner at 750 every single morning, rain or shine, and people would drop their kids off. But then some of those people started just parking their car at the, at the walking school bus stop and walking with us. And we were amazed. I mean, we met these, all these parents that would have, we never would have interacted with because our kids weren't the same age. You know, one mom literally is like, I lost 10 pounds doing the walking school bus. Um, you know, we got to know people. We talked about what we were reading, what we were thinking about, you know, the kids got to play out outside. They love walking in the rain. Um, so it just ended up being this amazing, I, I think that was sort of the unexpected benefit. Like we started it because we were like, Hey, we need to move more. We got to get out of the drop-off lane. It's great for our kids to move more. I mean, that was really where we started and where we ended was this is this amazing community experience where people have a time to be off their phones, connect and move. And I feel the same way about walking generally. Like my mom, who is total stud is 77 years old and she has always been a lifelong mover. And, but as she's gotten older, she's been struggling to find people to like hike and walk with, right? Because she's in her seventies and not everybody can. And so what I suggested to her, which I suggest to literally everyone, whether it's walking or exercise is, is, you know, set a day in time and have that be set in stone, just like the walking school bus was. And so my mom decided to start this hiking club. It's every Wednesday morning at 10 AM and, and it's at a different location each time, but there's not a ton of communication about it. It's just like, it's happening no matter what, whoever's able to go goes. And now she has this group of like, you know, eight to 10 women all in their seventies and they just go out and walk every Wednesday. Um, and it's just been transformative for this group of women because, you know, they have, and I think especially as we age and in, in, in that particular age group, seventies, eighties, people start to feel alone and isolated. And so it's particularly important for that, that subset. So there's just so many ways in which just walking, you know, a mile and a half gives you this chance to be outside you also of see our your technology. Neighbors, you, see your you see your neighborhood, you see your neighbor's neighborhood, create this loose network associations. And what we have stumbled into my first year of physio school, we were right next to the occupational therapist. And I noticed that they were working with people who had just had CVAs, cerebral vascular accidents, strokes, all these things. And when someone came in with uh, an impairment on, let's say their left side, you know, they, they have diminished function on their left side, what they would do is constrain the less affected side. The both sides are affected, but the less affected side. So if you're you, like your left hand is, is now you know, in the behavior of someone who's had a stroke and your right hand, you're doing everything with your right hand, they would actually tape up your right hand and make you do everything with your left hand. Mm-hmm. They would force it. Because what we saw is this, this behavior called learned disuse. And so be, as soon as people stop, we we're like, oh, this left hand is a pain in the butt, so I just won't use it anymore. Then you lose the capacity early on, especially to regain any function or to force yourself into using that thing. And that is called environmental constraint. And we started applying that to things like burpees. Oh, you see you're jumping and landing in a wretched position. You get to jump and land with your feet together. That's a <laughs> sort of an idea of environmental constraint where we say, hey, this isn't just about do more work. This is about how do we shape the environment so that we have a better outcome that we don't have to think about. So I was just in Japan like a week ago, and one of the rooms I had in Japan was all on the ground. The ufton, the, the futon was on the ground. The chairs are on the ground. You, you sit on the ground in the toilet and you know, in the shower. Everything is off the ground. And I was like, well, we wouldn't even have to talk about your hip range of motion because you can't even exist in this room unless you can get up and down off the ground 50 times tonight, let alone, right, exercise or anything else. So, Well, can I tell a quick sub story? There, he, they actually got to this hotel and um, Kelly was originally supposed to share a room with another guy on the trip, but he had a bit of a cold, so they decided they should not share a room. Sure. And so the hotel staff started freaking out because they didn't have a room available for Kelly. And so the guide had to get involved and say, no, you do have a room. And it turns out they did have rooms available, but they had a mix of rooms at this hotel, some for American uh, travelers yes. with like normal size beds and tables. And the rooms they had available were all of these floor specific rooms like Kelly got. And, um, and so they literally were freaking out. They're like, we can't put this American in here because American, like he's not gonna be able to get out of, we're going to have to <laughs> come like, help I him get this. out of bed in the morning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And they, they didn't know, they didn't know life for this. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but yeah, they, they literally have like at a single hotel, two separate types of rooms to deal with like people who have different and if, range of motion and, if you and cultural habits. you can take this idea 
of environmental constraint, you can apply it across your world. So whether it's walking your kids to school, you know, whether it's, hey, EC, I have a cookie problem. And I think you were like, it's super easy, Kelly. You just don't buy cookies and put them in your house. And I was like, right. noted. Like it's, you know, so how can you continue to shape your local environment so that you have, don't have to make a different outcome? So you don't have to make a choice. Some cultures are set up for this. You know, whether it's kids riding the subway to school in Tokyo and the whole culture watches out for the kids, whether it's creating a walking school bus where your kids, they walk because that's what we do and that's what we've always done, right? Or the school says, if you live within a mile of the school, you can't drive to school. There's a thousand ways where we're clever enough to shape our environments where we can have a better physical out, outcome if we can be clever enough to use it. And, and look, that's that's behavior modification, behavioral language change 101. Yeah. I love that story about the hotel. You've been waiting for that for life. You're like, what's the yeah, lowest bed so you've got? He's like, yeah. He's like, I got this. I'm I know. so it's, excited. I am me, ready. Me, me, choose me, choose me. <laughs> That's amazing. Um, yeah. So we've hinted a little bit about the 800 gram challenge. I have to admit, I understand there's 10 vital signs. I think one of them's the best. Um, that's the one talking about eating 800 grams of fruits and vegetables. So you guys have been longtime supporters since uh, I kind of launched it into the the public space. I'd love to hear about just kind of, obviously I know you like it, but maybe recommending it to people professionally, personally, and kind of some of the results you've seen with it. Let, let me take a swing at this first and say that in my recent professional experience, I have run into wretched fueling, under fueling in our performance athletes mm. that we've seen athletes getting injured, athletes f feeling burnout and Again, those are complex psychoemotional, psychomotor issues. And when I kind of lean into those things a little bit, I'm like, well, tell me what you eat. <laughs> you know, it, it ends up being a rake that people, and I know they're going to step on. And I don't know where people got this message that, you know, fruit has sugar and sugar will kill you or go. You know, Thank this, you, 1990s. This, I'm, I'm back to the 90s again. This melon and this apple, or God forbid you ever eat a right. banana, Don't so dangerous. It. What we saw was that, you know, we were, I was beginning to solve really seemingly complex problems just by fueling and making sure that we were talking about micronutrients. And as soon as we made that framework, people were like, oh, I, that makes more sense. Fiber is really good for me. Yes, that's right. You don't have to have diarrhea every day. Right. And you can have more micronutrients and have healthier tissues, comma, and you're full. The thing I think that has been transformational in our community that Juliet will talk about even more, I think, is that we have built in calorie control. Mm -hmm. We have built in autonomy where, you know, people don't feel like they're, you know, on some unsustainable diet. And then, and then I would, after you go, I'd love to talk about my own experience. Yeah. I mean, I would just say, you know, from my perspective, you know, again, like I mentioned before, you know, we are often the, the, the point of, um, expertise on like all things health in, in our community. And one of the big topics has been over the years, nutrition. And I mean, we've seen everybody do everything, keto and intermittent fasting and, you know, whatever it is, what, whatever is Paleo the latest, cleanse. greatest thing, you know, people are doing it and trying it. Um, but you know, one of the things I've learned over the years is yes, you know, people have, body composition goals. And many people would like to be a few pounds thinner, but people also want to enjoy life and they want to be able to go out to dinner and they want to be able to eat dinner with their kids. And they want to be able to like experience the joy that is eating, which is like, in my opinion, one of the greatest things about being a human. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think people are just tired of the restrictive diet mentality. I think people are over it. I think they're tired of it. It hasn't um, worked. I think, you know, like one of the most influential nutrition pieces of work that's ever been put out there, um, because I'm a precision nutrition coach is mm -hmm. that article called the cost of getting lean, which yeah. I like to repost like once a year, because I think it's so important. I think when people are really honest with themselves, the vast majority of people don't really want to be that lean because mm -hmm. if they look at the trade off for being that lean, it's not worth it to them. Most people want to be able to like eat the same thing as their kids are eating for dinner and go out to dinner with their friends on the weekends. And most people want to kind of like, you know, operate as a normal person in society when it comes to food. Most people don't want to be so restricted that they're weird. And, um, and so I think what's been so transformative for 
our own larger community, and this is both athletes and non-athletes alike, is that it's like the 800 gram challenge is the first time any like eating style, whatever you want to call it. Like I don't even like to use the word diet because it's not a diet. Um, Personal identity. Whatever identity, whatever it is you want to call it. Like and maybe you have created Religion. a word for it. You can tell us, you see what the word is for. Cult. It, but, but it's the first thing that we've ever been involved with nutritionally that is expansive and not restrictive. And, yeah. and I think that blows people's minds. They're like, wait, what? You're telling what? me I need to eat more of these things. And, and I just think it's really like, it gives people this whole new window into being able to actually enjoy the food they are eating, to get back into cooking, to not feel like they failed if they're at the airport and they have to eat a banana. Um, because that's the only thing available, God forbid, bananas. Um, so yeah, and and for me personally, I mean, I, I, I'm, I think I'm at a phase in my life and it could just be my age where I'm really less excited about, you know, focusing all my energy and tension on being as lean as I can possibly be. Like, mm. I just want to be healthy and feel oh, good in my body. Your abs are good enough. Well, but you know what I'm Check saying. Check your like ab I, privilege, woman. But um you know, I'm just not, I've been leaner though. I've been leaner. I just don't care as much. I want to be able to be, my goal is to be healthy and feel good. Um, and feel like I'm sustaining my body nutritionally. Like that's really my own goal. And for me, this is hands down, like been the most sustainable, fun, easiest way to feel like I'm really supporting my body, supporting my tissues, supporting my mental health. Um, and back to the whole community piece, again, like food is such an important exactly. community thing. Um, so I think that's been another challenge with this big diet culture is that, you know, the moment that you're on a restrictive diet, man, like you're out of the community. You can't go out. You can't enjoy food with people in a normal way. Um, so, you know, for me, both personally, it's it's like the greatest, the greatest and simplest thing to do. And by far the, the thing we recommend to everyone. I mean, like weekend warriors, athletes, you name it as an eating style. Yeah, How would you describe it by the way? Can I punt that back to you? Is it like an eating yeah. style? Like what's the word? I actually what's the just vocabulary word? In, I just go in and use diet because I use diet as what are you eating? But yes, I admit there's a little bit of like, yeah, oh you have gosh. to redefine diet. <laughs> right, I agree. Right. Diet is what are you eating? And if diet is what you're eating, then it's a diet. It's well, great. you know, one of the things about the 800 gram challenge, which is so important is that, it, you know, I'm like, well, I want you to splurge, eat an entire melon and that's like 200 calories. <laughs> you know. know what I mean? And I'm like, I know. Still hungry? like a whole pound of cherries. Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> Go for I it. Know. Kumite. Exactly. And you know, one of the things I think is really amazing for whatever reason, vegetables can be a harder sell for people. Mm -hmm. You know, Juliet, uh, because of our friend Margaret who works with us, Mm -hmm. uh, Margaret makes three vegetables every dinner. There's always three vegetables there. Wow. Three vegetable rule. Through the th we have now, it's called formalized, codified, the three vegetable rule. So if you're making right. a dinner, you have three different kinds of vegetables. And the idea is you eat a little bit of some, you, you know. Yep. One of the things that's so powerful about this is because vegetables are often a hard sell, because we've been told to fear their, their skins and things, mm -hmm. um, you know, we have found even that they're bitter and adults don't like them. So it opens up a whole wing of micronutrient availability through fruits. And it says, if you, man, if you're the only vegetable you can give your kid is a carrot, mm -hmm. then look at all these other fruits that you can get and you're not going to blow their sugar load and nuke them. You know, they're not eating six bananas at once only. And all of a sudden it really opens up the door for people who were eating carnivore because they liked what it did for their body. And then you invite them to eat berries. And suddenly we really find that it's, as Juliet said in the right word, it's expansive eating. And it really does get people more curious. I saw Ryan Fisher like eat a new fruit every day. He was like, I don't know what this fruit is. And, <laughs> but it, it got him out of his, like, I eat a bag of frozen berries and this, this ground hamburger every day right. into exploring more. And again, when we, for me personally, it is, I think my greatest challenge is I'm under calorie day after mm. day. Mm. I don't eat enough protein and I don't eat enough fruits and vegetables. So that's the one, these are the, of all the things in this book, those two things, getting enough protein, hitting enough fruits and vegetables every day is the thing that is like my base practice. Sleep yeah. and some of that stuff, I nail, I don't worry about. Obviously my range of motion is decent, but <laughs> this thing is the anchor for me. Yeah. Yeah. Well then to kind of wrap up, let's put you on the spot, Juliet, out of the 10 vital signs, what's your Achilles heel or which one do you need to work on the most? Oh, well, heel is the right word because I have uh, the most inflexible ankles 
known to man. Like, I don't know if it's, you know, Kelly would disagree with this, but I'm like, I think I came out of the womb with like my ankles like fused. No, that's true. You did. Um, And in fact, I always like to tell Kelly, I'm like, I would have been way more successful as a CrossFit Games athlete if I had ankle range of motion like that. That's the limiter for me. Like I had all the other things going for me. Um, Missing ankle range of motion was kind of it for me. So, so for me, that is by far my Achilles Mm. heel. So that's something that I have to be always mindful of because it's not, um, it's just, it's a challenge for me. So the, the squat test vital sign is for me, like number one, biggest challenge, the biggest thing I have to keep an eye on. And I mean, I'm really aware of it too, because I do feel like, you know, when it, because it impacts so many other things, it impacts my hip range of motion. Um, it impacts my balance. And so I do feel like, you know, that's the vital sign for me that I have to keep the biggest eye on making sure that I'm you know, I, I'm never going to have Kelly range of motion ever, but I, my goal at this point in my life is to like keep what I have, maybe try to gain a little bit more and definitely not lose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you could probably handle the the Japanese hotel with the bed on the floor. So I think you're doing okay. Exactly. <laughs> oh, what she does when we go, we, we camp with our kids, you know, we we're spending a lot of time on the rivers and Julia is, you know, we are a little bit crippled sleeping on a hard mat on the floor sometimes for the first day mm-hmm. or two, but then we adapt. Yeah. The other thing I want to say, though, about back, can I go back to the 800 gram challenge for a second? Oh, sure. I think um, it's been really interesting to see, too, um, in recommending this to people, because I think once you do it for a while, you know, I mean, we've been doing the 800 gram challenge now for like five years or something. Right. Um, and our whole staff does it, by the way. In fact, I think I told you once that people bring these like Tupperwares of perfectly right. measured fruits and vegetables. And like if you try to steal <laughs> one blueberry out of it, they're like, ah, you know, um, so it's it's definitely it's their like job. part it's of our at this point. <laughs> yeah, it's on it's part of our company culture to be doing the 800 gram challenge, but I think it it's it's shocking to people actually mm-hmm. when we've recommended it to people, you know, often we have people come see us because they're about they you know, they're looking down the the they're looking down having a surgery and so they want to start to get ready for the surgery and they ask mm-hmm. us what our advice is. Um and you know, one of our biggest pieces of advice is do the 800 gram challenge and make make sure you're eating enough protein leading up to the surgery mm-hmm. like you need to follow that. And I mean, we have countless people who come to us and say, Oh my God, I thought I was eating fruits and vegetables and I was eating like 150 grams a day. So I think it's really shocking for people. I think the other thing that's so beautiful about it though, is that you may need to measure for a short amount of time. Um, but then you really don't have to, I mean, once you sort of, you know, do simple things like making sure you have a couple handfuls of fruits and vegetables in each one of your meals, like, you know, you're golden. So you're not stuck in the prison of measuring and weighing for the rest of your life, which can feel like a prison to people. It's like a very short term thing. So I just think it's so accessible. And I think it really is eye opening to people who, you know, think they're eating a very healthy diet and then realize just tracking a couple of days, they're like, oh my God, I don't eat any micronutrients at all. I mean, I just eat bars. You know, if we're talking about all the collagen that people are taking right now, (laughs) right? If you don't have any vitamin C on board, you can't actually utilize that collagen. And you're vitamin C depleted by the morning. So sometimes I have a little fresh squeezed OJ and I give my kids a little shot of fresh squeezed OJ. They don't explode. Their sugar doesn't crash. I mean, it's not. But I'm like, if you don't have any vitamin C on board, you can't utilize all of this and turn it into collagen. So, you know, suddenly you're like, well it's a lot easier to just get the nutrients. And, and <laughs> as you have so eloquently written about, there are so many issues around bone density and connective tissue health and all these things that are driven through micronutrient supplementation or actually what we call eating food. The <laughs> cool thing about the Anagram Challenge is that it aligned perfectly with really what we saw in the revolution of sports performance, which was eating whole foods. Mm-hmm. And it really became... It, it, we're starting to see now that people are spending more and more time feeding and fueling with whole foods. I uh, worked with the Niners last year mm. pretty closely. And one of the things that they did was they hired a chef in the off season before last year to come in and cook every day. So they gave wow. athletes, their, their athletes permission to stick around and have three meals a day at the stadium or at the training facility and those young athletes were like, sign me up. There's a chef who's cooking for me. Totally. And if you if you give athletes whole foods, they'll eat whole foods. If you totally. let them, you know, turn them loose, they'll eat whatever's around. What totally. can I say one more thing and of ask course. you a question, Easy? Of course. So um so I think 
what we are really trying to get at with this book, Build to Move, and I think why we love the 800 gram challenge so much and your message is I do think that we're part of this, I think, growing group of people in the broader health and fitness business that are trying to get back to basics and help people get back to basics. I think we've a bunch of us and, you know, us and you and other people we know in the space have realized the mistakes we've made in terms of fire hosing people with a bunch of crazy information and, and, you know, telling them that they can, you know, never eat a vegetable if they take X, Y, and Z supplement or whatever. Like we've really sort of missed the forest through the trees as, as an industry. And so I think that's the, I think that's part of the reason why we're so excited to put this in our book because it's so fits perfectly with our sort of back to basics philosophy. And it's a vital sign. And it's a vital sign. But then I want to punt it back to you because you obviously are definitely doing fine in that vital sign. Mm. Um, but you also, <laughs> you know, have been a CrossFitter and a serious athlete your whole life and train hard. Oh, so man. I guess my question back to you is like, of all the vital signs, which one or ones do you think are blind spots for you? If any. Oh, if man. any. Oh, or are yeah. you perfect? No, not perfect, but I, I thought I was going to get out of that question. Um, the extend your hips, that gosh darn couch stretch. I mean, why did that, why did you create that thing? <laughs> but I it will hurts. say this. It hurts badly. I will say this. I got a dog about a year or so ago and I spend way more time walking. And I do think that has improved my hip range of motion for sure. So it turns out these things are all connected. Like you mentioned, <laughs> love it. Yeah. And holding yeah, different you know, positions besides sitting all day is, has been helpful for my hip <laughs> range of motion. Weird. It's really weird. Yeah. Go so figure, strange. go figure. Yeah. So that remains my Achilles heel and weird. I had back issues for years. So, I mean, it's, you know, it's finally coming together a few years down, <laughs> down the pipeline here of what's going on, but, uh, that would be my weakness for sure. So but um, anyway, I don't want to take all of your day. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, again, we're going to put the links for people to pre-order for Built, Built to Move. It's an awesome Back to Basics, as we just mentioned. And I really hope people pick up a copy and take advantage of all of the information there. So thank you guys again. We're so grateful so to grateful. have your brain represented and uh, to point people at this resource. We really feel like the 800 gram challenge and lazy macros, in your word, solves human eating dysfunction. It really is it's it's that powerful. Transformative. It's one of the most powerful messages we have in this book. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning into the show this week. Thank you to Juliet and Kelly Sturrett for joining us. Again, highly recommend you check out their new book called Built to Move. Links to it are in the show notes. If you are not yet subscribed or following us wherever you are listening or watching this episode, please do. That will help ensure that EC and I can continue to have conversations like this and put episodes out into the world. We highly appreciate it. We thank you for it. EC and I will be back next week for another episode of The Consistency Project. <laughs>